Well, good morning. How's my family this morning? Am I on? I think I'm on. Hello. Am I on, guys? Nope. There we are. Uh oh. Now I sound like my wife. I'm loud. Amen. <laughs> that was bad. That's not a good start, is it? Hey, we really need to thank this uh, fantastic band we have. They just blew it away last night. Man, they built their own float. Man, they uh, they were exciting. So uh, a lot of people got introduced to them last night, and uh, uh, thankful to all the other people that helped. Jesus showed up there, didn't he? That was some good stuff. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Well, some of you may uh, know Jesus pretty well. And, uh, as many people in this world prepare right now to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, that's going on now. How many people do you believe, out of all the people that's getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, can claim that he's their Jesus? How many people do you think that is? There you go. Well, here I know we have many, but across the world, not so. You know, Jesus' birth in the manger, it began not in Nazareth, as many people think, but in the Garden of Eden. The road to Bethlehem began in the Garden of Eden, where sin was brought into the world by Adam and Eve. If we consider that, you think, well, God was paving the way, right? He's, he's paving the way for what's going to happen in prophecy. And if we follow prophecy, we'd understand from the very start there was a plan. And it all led on the road to the manger where Jesus was born. And we should consider that through prophecy and history, it was revealed that the Lord paved the way from the manger to modern faith, preparing generations of people to know his son in that process. Man, we should be totally excited that we can claim that he's my Jesus. But today, even with all the evidence, there are many people who don't know or accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I say don't know. Uh, as much as, as uh, things happen in our lives, as much as it's exposed to people, they know about Jesus but they can't claim it's my Jesus. You know, many people can say, hey, I, I've heard about Jesus. I, I know the stories and all that, but to claim that he is their Jesus kind of sets them apart. They, many people, they don't want any part of that. So to help those folks out this morning, we as Christians should be telling everyone that we meet about our Jesus. Amen? We should be sharing that. So let's look at some scriptures together to see what they say about Jesus and who he is and what he really should mean in our lives. So I want you to take your fingers and do this because you're going to need them. We're going to be in a lot of scripture today. Reg ain't about a lot of scripture because he gets lost or he puts the wrong scripture down. If I do that, it's okay. Courtney's not here to correct me this morning. So just get your fingers ready because we're going to Isaiah chapter 43. That's where we're going to begin first. Verse 15. I'll make sure I wait on you all this time. I usually go too fast. So, Isaiah chapter 43, beginning at verse 15. Once again, I pray you brought your Bible with you or you're looking at the Scripture as we do because you shouldn't take my word for it. We need to look at it straight from the Bible, from God's holy word. We should be looking at this together. So you just don't hear what I'm reading. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and your king. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses and the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the howls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give a drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, 
that they may proclaim, proclaim my praise. Now, this scripture, you say, well, how does that fit in? Well, here, Isaiah shares that God is our God, or your God. He is the creator and the king of everything. Creator and king of everything. And he is the one who cut a path through the mighty ocean to protect Israel and allow Pharaoh's army to come in and struck down Pharaoh's army right there when he closed the Red Sea over top of them. He made a way. He was preparing a way right there for our future. Because without that, Israel will still be in bondage. Amen? He also shares that we are told that we should forget about the past because the great I am is creating something new. So he had a plan. We're going to start off there. You know, he's saying, hey, I'm going to create something new. So quit worrying about what was in the past. And he's talking to the people of Israel saying, hey, let that go. You know, you're, you're, you've been brought out of bondage. Let it go. Move on. Let's do a new thing. And the Lord was creating something new by sending his son, Jesus, to save the world. So what's going on here? John chapter 3, verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Is that a new thing? Amen. Because everything else was under law, now it's under grace. So he's sending his son that we can get rid of all the past in our lives. So with that said, let me tell you about my Jesus. My Jesus came into this world through a virgin girl that God had found favor on. We find that in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. If you join me there. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who had, was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to, to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now we, we learned also that at the time, the angel Gabriel was commanded by God to protect Jesus. From that day, from that very day, to protect Jesus from all Satan's attacks. Because right now, you know, Satan done figured it out. Hey, something's fixing to change. There's fixing to be something new. And I need to get in the middle of it because it's not going to be good for me, right? So that's why God commanded him to look after Jesus and protect Mary and Joseph and everybody else. But mainly, Jesus. And my Jesus was born of humble beginnings in a stable in Bethlehem that was used for farm animals. Humble beginnings. He didn't come in blasting with a bunch of fanfare, you know, all the way that you think somebody mighty and high, a new king was going to come. He came in in humble beginnings to join us, to be part of us. So join me in Luke chapter 2. We're right there in Luke already. Chapter 2, verse 6. It says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth 
and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So it's telling us right there, you know, it's simple. He's, he's in a manger. He's, he, you know, there's probably animals are all around. The Bible's really not clear how many animals were in there with them, but you can bet there were some farm animals around. I'll bet it wasn't the best smelling place in the world, right? But Jesus wanted to be one of us. He wanted to be part of us. And he wanted us to know what humble beginnings are like. That we might humble ourselves and be like other people too. Don't judge. Don't put ourselves above everybody else. Be equal. And that's what Jesus was trying to do here. And my Jesus' birth was announced to the shepherds which were considered at that time as the scum of the earth. The shepherds out in the field, they were considered scum. But Jesus' birth was announced to them first. It's like, man, why didn't he go to everyone else? Because once again, he wanted to be humble. He wanted to, he wanted to be part of us. That they weren't scum to him, that he loved everybody. And we were all going to be equal. And my Jesus, as a young boy, even his own parents lost him. That just shows they're just normal parents, right? They lost Jesus. Can you imagine that conversation with God? Hey, God, we got a problem here. You know that little boy you gave us? We don't know where he's at. Could you make us another one? We know you made one. Can you make us another one? Boy, wouldn't that be an awkward conversation? Would you like to be the one to go to Jesus and say, hey, I lost your son? <laughs> Tough things. But you know, it's part of prophecy. And you can already tell how important Jesus was going to be to everyone just for the things he was doing. And the reason his parents lost him, because at 12 years old, he's in the temple preaching. He wasn't lost. He wasn't lost at all. God knew exactly where he was. Just as he knows exactly where we are. All times. Knows every hair on our head. The Bible tells us that. My Jesus performed miracles. All kinds of miracles. Join me in John. We're going to be in chapter 2. Verse 1. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, On the third day a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Now, can you think about that right there? You know Jesus is Lord. Because if you said that to your mom, you, would you have any teeth left? But he said, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so they are filled to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guest have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So this is just one. In fact, this was his first miracle. The very first miracle, which there were many more to come. You know, we know that Jesus healed the blind. We know that, that he healed the sick. And we know that, that he healed ten lepers. And we know he healed the cripple. And he just continued to do one miracle after another. Sometimes I think we have to have a miracle in our lives before we will really believe in Jesus Christ. Some of you here today can testify you've had miracles in your life. I have. And you can testify to that. But 
You know, my Jesus could even walk on water. Is that a miracle? Amen. He could walk on water. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Let's go there together. Am I going too fast for you? I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Jesus had been preaching on the shoreline and he had sent everyone away and he had said immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. My Jesus walked on the water. My Jesus even encouraged Peter to get out of what boat and walk on the water with him. And Peter believed in Jesus. Amen. But somewhere in the midst of getting out walking on the water, Peter took his eyes off Jesus and down he went. But the great thing is Jesus was right there, reached out his hand, pulled him right back up. Sometimes we can get that way. You know, we can get a little distracted or we can take our eyes off Jesus and lose sight of what's really important in our lives. Very simple to do. And my Jesus said he would never leave me or forsake me. He also said he would protect me. And if we believe that, then we have that. We have that protection. But we've got to believe it. And I believe that he wouldn't leave us. Deuteronomy 31, chapter 8. Verse, uh, chapter 31, verse 8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Okay, back, right here in scripture, it tells us, why are we afraid of things? Why are we worried about things? He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. Jesus is real in many different ways. And we see it through miracles. We see it through witnesses, others. There was a hired county sheriff, Jerry Marr. Got a disturbing call one Sunday afternoon a few months ago. His six-year-old grandson, Mikey, had been hit by a car while fishing in Greentown with his dad. The father and son were near a bridge by the Como Reservoir when a woman lost control of her car, slid off the bridge, and hit Mikey at a rate of about 50 miles an hour. Sheriff Marr had seen the results of accidents like this, and he feared the worst. For his grandson. When he got to St. Joseph's Hospital, he rushed through the emergency room to find Mikey conscious and fairly and in fairly good spirits. Mikey, what happened? Sheriff Mar asked. Mikey replied, Well, Papa, I was fishing with Dad, and some lady runned over me. I fell into a mud puddle and broke my fishing pole. And I didn't get to catch no fish. As it turned out, the impact propelled Mikey about 500 feet over a few trees and an embankment in the middle of a, and he landed in the middle of a mud puddle. His only injuries were his right femur bone, which had been broken in two places. Mikey had surgery to place pins in his legs, otherwise the boy is fine. Since all the boy could talk about was his broken fishing pole, the sheriff went out to Walmart and bought him a new one while he was in surgery so he could have it when he came out. The next day, the sheriff sat with Mikey to keep him company in the hospital. Mikey was enjoying his new fishing pole and talked about when he could go fishing again as he cast into a trash can from his bed in the hospital. When they were alone, Mikey, just a matter of fact, said, Papa, did you know Jesus is real? Well, the sheriff replied, a little startled. Yes, Jesus is real to all who believe in him and love him in their hearts. 
No, said Mikey. I mean, Jesus is really real. What do you mean, asked the sheriff. I know he's real because I saw him. Said Mikey, he's still casting into the trash can, but he's carrying on a conversation. The sheriff said, you did? You saw him? He said, yep. He said, when that lady run over me and broke my fishing pole, Jesus caught me in his arms. And laid me down in the mud puddle. Amen. Is Jesus real? It's a little boy. Why would he say something like that? The thing is, we got to believe Jesus is real. If he walked through those back doors today, would we believe in him? Would we believe in him? Would we? You got to be skeptical, I guess. There's so many false witnesses. So what are we looking for? It's called faith. Faith. You've got to have true faith. And you, it, you, your faith will grow even stronger if you obtain that, uh, that just intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Be in his word every day. Search him out for everything that's going on in your life. Because his word in this Bible is a great road map. It's great for counseling. It's great for direction. It's great for just, uh, just encouraging us. But you've got to get in the Word to do it. Oops, lost my place. I told you I'd do something like that, didn't I? Oops, wrong thing. Okay, let's see if we can fix it. Y'all be patient with me. I know Jesus is. <laughs> Here we go. My Jesus showed love, mercy, and grace to everyone. Did you know when he walked the earth, he didn't... Look how far-reaching he is today. And he only walked about 50 miles from his very home through his whole life. 50 miles away from where he lived and where he was born and raised, the whole deal. He only walked 50 miles. So how, if there's no Jesus... How did so many people learn about him? How did so many people, why is it, are we still knowing about him today? Wasn't like he went around the world saying, I'm Jesus. And why? Because he allowed everybody else to do that. And he's still asking us to do that today. 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. Buster, that's what all these notes do to you. They kind of get you thrown off course, don't they? Grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be, uh, be with us in truth and love. You know, my Jesus revealed his true love for me dying on a cross in a horrible way. In a horrible way. Luke chapter 23, verse 3, 33, if you join me there. Luke chapter 23, you know, verse 33. Yeah, 23. I'm even confused, so. That's not it. Nope, that's not it. Oh, no wonder I'm on the wrong page. Okay, that might be it. Golly. Read you or something else. Uh, it says, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals on the right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Right there, 
When Jesus died on the cross, even though I was a sinner, even all, all the other folks were sinners, because there was no perfect person, Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. So he's forgiven each and every one of us if we've accepted him into our hearts and into our lives. And when they came to that place, there on the place called the skull and crucified him, they drove nails in his hands and feet. Horrible death, raised him up and then mocked him and made fun of him. But he did all that for us, for every one of us. And can you imagine going through that and then saying, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing? But here's the good news. Even through all that, here's the good news. Death in the grave could not hold my Jesus. He rose from the grave. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So the grave couldn't hold him. The protection that Jesus had wasn't just at the birth. It was all the way through, and you go, well, how did that work? He got crucified in a horrible way and hung on a cross. But how did that work? Well, that was to fulfill prophecy, and he did that for us. He still wants to protect us today. He still wants to be a part of our lives today. As we grow closer to the uh, birth of Jesus Christ this month, we should stop and consider just exactly how important it is. Jesus is to us. What would our lives be if he hadn't intervened? They'd be chaos everywhere. I would hate to think that I lived in a world without Jesus. But there's so many people out there now that are living in that type of world. And it's getting worse every day. The percentages of Christians in today's uh, United States and around the world is just dropping by the day after day. And if you mention the word Jesus, you can make people mad. But I believe this, if Jesus protected, if Jesus was protected by Gabriel from the very start, just because I mentioned his name, I think he's going to protect me too. I'm going to have that courage. You know, we went to Branson, Missouri last week with Danny Benham and Sharon, and uh, we got to go see the miracle of Christmas, which is kind of the Christmas story, you know, really, really good. And something I missed in all that, and we agreed that we missed it in, you know, when Jesus was in the, in the manger ready to be born, when Mary was in there and Jesus was ready to be born, well, the angel, angels were all overhead. They were waiting because they were getting ready for the announcement, but they were waiting and Gabriel was right there overseeing this whole thing. And then during this play, here comes Satan flying in with his wings. And the battle's on. I mean, the battle's on. It's great. I never looked at it that way. And when it just all, what happened is when Gabriel slapped Satan with that sword, he went spinning backwards in fire, left the scene. So Gabriel was still protecting Jesus before his birth. And we're still being protected today because of what Jesus said. In this message today, I want everyone to understand that Jesus is not only my Jesus, but everyone's Jesus. He's just waiting on you. He's standing there with the arms wide open, waiting on you, waiting on us. If we haven't accepted him, we haven't made that step of commitment yet, he's waiting. But not only that, he's encouraging us to go get other people to accept him. Lead other people to know him. Go share your Jesus with everyone else. He's there for everyone, not just me, that accepts him as their Lord and Savior.
And you don't need to be afraid that Jesus won't accept you because of your past. Because I hear that all the time. Well, I can't walk in that church. The building will fall. No, it won't. It's held up by Jesus. Amen? It's not true. And your past is your past. And that's what Jesus tells us. It is the past. Leave it there. People walk through those back doors this morning dragging their past in here with them. Well, here you are laying at the foot of the cross and walk out without it. You don't need it. Because that's what drags you down. And that's what keeps you separated from Jesus Christ. So don't do that. Don't be afraid of Jesus. I've got many people are, are afraid. They're afraid they'll have to change. Jesus is not going to make you change. But if you accept Jesus, you'll want to change. You have a choice. So don't be afraid of Christ. You don't have to be a scholar in theology. You don't need to know any of that. You don't even have to know the Bible from front to back. Just know Jesus. Know who he is and what he means to you and what he'll mean to others. That's all you need to know. It's that simple. But if we're afraid, or if we deny Christ, he'll deny us. Step out. He came so we could all be free of our past. And he set in place something new for our future. So why don't we grab hold of that? Why don't we accept that and why don't we start to share that? You know that my Jesus showed up last night right down there in the middle of Palm. He's here today. And I promise you next Sunday night he's going to be here. And we're going to show what our Jesus is like. Amen. I pray today that you leave here today that you can also witness to others that you can find the strength and the courage no matter what the world tells you to open your mouth and say let me tell you about my Jesus let's pray Father God we come to you this morning we lift this day to you Father Father we're so thankful for the many blessings you pour out on your church house and this church family Father we're thankful for the opportunity we had last night to be a witness to others Father, that maybe through all of this that's going on with the birth of your son coming up, Father, maybe we can get someone excited about Jesus. Father, I pray you give us the strength and courage as your word says it will, that you would lead us forward to speak the name of Jesus in everything we do, everyone we visit with, that we might get them excited, that they might grow close to you. Father, we pray that we stay behind you, that you lead. We don't step out in front of you and do things in the wrong way. Father, that we'd follow your lead and do them in the right way. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. Father, I know there's someone here today or someone listening out there on social media. There's someone that they're separated from Jesus. They're afraid or they don't know him. And if you're that person and you feel led or you feel like something's tugging on you, and you want to know more about Jesus, we want to introduce you to him this morning. Just pray with me. Pray this simple prayer. Father, come into my heart. Father, I want you to be my Jesus. I want you to be a big part of my life. And Father, I accept you as my Lord and Savior beginning today. I believe you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins and shortcomings in my life. And starting today, I commit my relationship and my life to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. If you said that.